It's story time! The Stonebearer, Chapter 9, Tuss. Master Pilot Percy, Devlin cried, turning quickly toward the lock cases where he kept his larger rail-mounted weapons. Take this ship down lower. There is a lot of movement off the starboard bow. He unlocked two brass latches with the flick of his thumbs, opened the case, and heaved out a large blast rifle. Let's hold up here until we can see what's going on out there. Percy quickly obeyed Devlin's command. Stardeer was close enough to the ground to send ripples across the tall grass like a boat on the water. Percy drew Stardeer abruptly around to a halt. The fighter craft rocked gently backward and forward, turbines hissing. There it is, Quan said, pointing. Do you see it? A two-legged figure could be seen racing over the grassy knobs about a mile away from them, sometimes disappearing from view in shallow valleys, when reappearing again on each rise. It turned from a near-parallel course with Stardeer, heading directly into the path of an oncoming plain storm. That's suicide, Dreer exclaimed. Gabriel brought a pair of scans to his eyes and flipped the night lenses off to the side. The next time the figure came into a view on the rise, Gabriel focused. As I thought, he said, it's that same Usurepi rider we saw the other night. Well, he's not going to beat the storm going that way, Dreer said. He's not trying to beat the storm, Dreer Frey Good, Dedlin said, securing the blast rifle to a mounted revolving hinge near the helm. He's escaping into it. Percy, be a good fellow and back us up into the shadows of that bluff over there. The rocks might hide us better inside those rocks. What I wouldn't give for a cloaking shield right about now. Dedlin's right, Ott said. There are three Garnian scout ships closing in on the rider from all sides. For whatever reason, they're in pursuit, and they're firing upon the rider, and he's returning fire. Gabriel found them in the scans. Could be the same ones that were telling us, but I don't see any fighters. He searched the peripheral horizons for other Garnian ships. Have they seen us, Binder asked, bringing a pair of scans to his eyes. I don't know. I don't think so. Well, I hope not. There's not a decent place to hide for miles, the commander said. We're sitting ducks out here. Devlin squinted. Plenty of places to hide, he said, if we need to. They watched the ship's bank and close in on the Usurepi rider as he faded over the last misty hill into the torrential distant rain. It appeared as if the Garnians were firing upon the rider in a succession of exploding volleys just as they passed the line of the horizon, and they could not be certain. It might have been the lightning instead. A few seconds later and they were all gone from sight. We can relax, Binder reported. I think they missed us. Wrong, Gabriel blurted from the other side of the deck. Look behind us. There's more of them, and they're heading this way. We've been spotted, Ott responded. Arm yourselves. Get us out of here, Master Pilot Percy, Dudlin said, fastening the gun on a second blast gun on the mount. Everyone, prepare to move. Prepare to fight. Percy pressed the accelerator bar to the full throttle. The noise of the turbines rose to a high pitch as Stardeer's nose rose skyward. The ship, the ship leaped like a rocket from the veil, accelerating into the sky at an incredible rate. Next part. How many, Devlin asked, coming to the aft rail? I count nine, Gabriel answered. Nine, Binder confirmed, seizing a blast rifle. Mostly fighters. This could be part of the fleet that we had missed earlier. I didn't lose them last night to be found by them again today, Devlin snapped. That's not the worst of it, Ott said suddenly. Look to the east. Warship at nine o'clock, Binder cried. From the east it came, a flying city fortress of silver, black, and red, arcing in a calculated sweep of the sky to try to cut them off. It was incredibly malevolent looking. We can't fight that, Binder cried. Faster, Devlin shouted above the wind. Follow the Usurapi. Head directly into that storm. Three of the nine ships separated from the rest and advanced towards Stardeer. Two others veered off toward the Usurapi rider. Percy scanned the oncoming storm, keeping Stardeer just feet above the ground. The wall of rain from the purple storm clouds directly before them resembled a ferocious, live, pulsating entity of some sort. A solid, wavering mass. Nets of lightning ripped through the sky. Thunder reverberated through air, through earth, ship, and bone. Tussa's homicidal storms like this one often rolled across the flatlands for miles and miles, building into 
nightmarishly destructive maelstroms that were reputed to be able to rip flesh from the bone. A cool wind passed over them, whipping its star deer's flimsy interior dewtar. The temperature dropped nearly 20 degrees almost instantly. The wind lashed from one direction, then another, as alternating cool and warm fronts taunted the delicate atmosphere. A few miles south, they saw twin twisters raging destruction in the fields as if dancing with one another. Visitor approaching port side, Ott cried out above the wind. One of the Garnian fighter ships drew within 30 yards of them. Suddenly, it fired a warning missile, startling the crew. It exploded two ship lengths ahead of Stardear, causing dirt and shrubbery to rain down upon their heads. Get the young king below, Deadland called. Binder, you're in charge. The commander quickly assessed the situation and took the decisive control. Dreyer, get King Day below and take care of him there. Lake and Cran below. Athagris and Gabriel, defend this ship with me and fire to destroy. Devlin, you are free to use your own means, but I suggest you remain close to Percy at the helm in case we have mishaps there. Try and get us out of this. The Usarepi rider had been engulfed by the storm and could not be seen now, followed by the scout ships and two fighter crafts. There were now two fighters coming up on the left of Stardear and three on the right, with the great warship closing in aggressively from behind. Another missile exploded in front of the Stardear. This one was close enough to send a shockwave throughout the frame of the ship. The nose bounced a bit from the impact, but Percy was able to level her off and maintain his course and speed. One of the fighters closed in in front of them, slowing to block their way. Percy steered masterfully around it without pause. They're going to try to drive us to the ground before we can reach the cover of this storm, Deadland said. They might try and clip us. But we have an advantage, Gabriel said, aiming one of the mounted blast guns. Their orders are to bring us in alive. He fired the huge gun. The side of the nearest Garnian vessel exploded into a cloud of fire and spirals of smoke. The heat from the explosion washed past them. Tiny shrapnel noisily littered the Stardear's flank like nails against a steel drum. The fighter ships arced to the side and crashed, rolling and bouncing in a ball of fire until it laid to rest upside down in the windswept flowers and reeds below. Binder fired, again, a hit, and another Garnian ship was disabled and fell off and behind. Banking to port, Percy warned. Two ships were squeezing in directly ahead of them. Hold on, Devlin called to those below. Stardear rose and arced gracefully to the port side, rising up and over the Garnians. They passed swiftly beneath, and then immediately they banked in opposite directions to circle back. Percy took Stardear up at a dangerously steep incline, keeping her at full throttle, then shifted, heading back toward the mountainous and tumultuous purple-black storm clouds. Raindrops the size of olives began spotting the deck with loud hammering splats. Percy, who had just closed the back wall of the helmsman's cabin door with his free hand, quickly fastened the hardcover rain shield roof above the pilot's chair. A burst of marble-sized hail drummed on them, and then it stopped. The warship was now below them and to their left, less than 50 yards away. A strange hollow tube sound could be heard, and Deadland and Binder cried out, Get down! Everyone dropped to the deck, even Percy, holding onto the guide stick above him with one hand. Cover your ears, the commander warned. A red cylindrical canister reached its arc height a few feet away from the helm at midship and exploded in the air with a heavy thrum. It was a pressure stunner. Deadlin, who was the closest to that blast, fell to the ground unconscious. Master Pilot Percy, Gabriel cried out, unable to hear his own voice because of the ringing in his ears. Deadlin is down. How are you? Binder fired another shot at the closest fighter ship, missing, but I connected, instantly vaporizing the closest Garnian fighter craft into a rainbow of fiery colors. He had hit the fuel tank. They're as mad as hornets now, Binder said. They could blow us out of the sky with ease if they wanted to. <clears throat> We've got to get out of here. What? I cried. Did you call for me? His hearing was also temporarily impaired. Percy, Gabriel cried again. It was an incredible effort just to speak, 
The pressure stunner had knocked his breath from him. He was struggling to get it back. Report! I need help, the Mehekian answered finally, his telepathic voice hazy and faint. Take the helm, someone. I need help. I've got it, Gabriel shouted, running low across the deck. Deadlin, can you hear me? Are you all right? Deadlin, answer me. A missile flew by them, dangerously close. They're trying to clip us now, Binder called. They'd rather take their chances and hit us rather than to lose us completely in the storm. The sky ahead was as dark as night. Long, crooked bolts of lightning sped through the sky, ripping and burrowing into a distant hill. The dark hills turned white with each vivid electrical display. The smell of burnt sulfur filled the air. The first wave of hard rain poured down on Star Deer in drenching gushes like added weight, saturating everything instantly. Get below, Gabriel ordered Percy. Take the wizard if you can. I've got Star Deer. Here comes the storm. Hold on. Rain blew in so hard that all visibility was instantly gone. Hail pounded in ferocious spurts like meteors, denting the plasteel hull and tearing holes in the thick canvas tarps. Binder and Aunt joined Gabriel at the helm, both soaked to the bone, but with the fire of battle flaring boldly in their eyes. They looked out through the wide rear window. The sunslit, frosted green hills of Tus were soon obscured and then lost from view behind them. Gabriel kept a dangerously fast pace, flying blindly just a few feet above the whipping grasses but eventually he was forced to slow down to compensate for his lack of vision and the increasing turbulence. The wind was incredibly loud. It wailed and shrieked and roared, tossing them first in one direction, then another. The rain fell hard enough to press the ship almost to the ground. I can hardly breathe, Ott exclaimed. Are we underwater? The Garnian ship cruised slowly past, just a few feet above them. Binder stretched his arm up and touched the rear dorsal fin as it crept blindly past. Fortunately, their scanners would be as useless in this storm as they were aboard Star Deer. Gabriel turned his ship directly south and crept away at the same snail space they had used the night before in the jungle forests. The warship won't come in after us. Binder suggested. They'll circle the storm and wait for us on the other side with reinforcements. Percy had not yet gone below. He sat with his head in his hands near Gabriel's feet. Deadland on the ground beside him began to stir, shaking his head as though clearing stifling webs from his mind. He looked around, empty-eyed. A leak in the roof poured a trail of rainwater on his head and face, but he didn't seem to notice or mind. Part of the roof suddenly blew back from the wind, dousing all of them anew with cold rainwater. Ott and Binder seized it and began reattaching it more securely. I think we're safe for the time being, Gabriel said. The Guardians are as lost in the storm as we are. Everyone okay? Advise me of any injuries. Jer poked his head up from below. I've turned on the internal cabin pump. We've got a lot of water coming in. We're flooded down here. It'll be all right, Percy advised, nodding. I just need a few minutes. Suddenly the wind scooped up under the ship like a giant hand, pushing Star Deer nearly onto her side. Gabriel fought to keep her steady and right side up. By the gods, he swore. Let's hope this storm doesn't prove worse than the Garnians, Devlin said, grunting with every movement. He tried to stand, but he was unable. He lay back, resting beneath the console. What was it? A pressure stunner? It feels as though the, my insides have been knocked out of me. And oh, my aching head. The ship moaned and whistled in the wind. Jer came up onto the deck, squeezing in with the rest. Everyone's fine below, he reported. We're batting down pretty good. King Day is secured in his favorite hammock chair. Uh, let me uh, help secure this area and get the weapons out of this rain before they're ruined. We don't want them malfunctioning when we need them next. Where are the Garnians? Uh, can you see them? Can you see anything in this? Not a thing, Gabriel answered, checking over the helmsman console. Water was dripping in all around them. This overhang is hardly adequate for rain blowing in at this angle. 
is pouring through the gaps around the edges. He rolled the tarp handle tighter, taking up all the slack he could. Turn on the lights, Devlin said. We don't want to accidentally hit anything or run aground. The Guardians won't see us unless they run into us anyway. Gabriel turned to the wizard and grimaced, but he complied. The torrential rain continued. Next part. Two days passed without reprieve from the rain. Sometimes it was a mild downpour, and other times it was impossible to do anything but hunker down and wait for it to subside. They had kept on course in any case, despite the efforts of an angry wind, and had covered many, many miles without any sight of the Garnian fleet. In fact, there was not much to see in Tus on the best and brightest of days, no trees, no hills to speak of, and very little wildlife, only slow, flat, sloping fields of grasses and reeds, mostly mired and swampy mires, and new lakes that came and went with the rains. I had provided a fine dinner by hunting for a few hours that second evening. He simply crept out over the rail of the ship and disappeared in the mists and rain, and then hardly any time later returned with a wild pig and two medium-sized wild plains turkeys. He had also come across a goodly number of wild red yams, and a batch of late-blooming may apples for everyone else. He was a strict carnivore himself, which Dreher Frey good combined with butter, sugar, cinnamon, and pears into a delicious baked pie. Dinner was served below a few hours after sunset with some mirth provided by Dreher's fine voice and musical abilities. On the third day traversing Tuss, the skies had nearly cleared except for spotty patches of rain clouds that could still attack quite suddenly at times. But as evening came, it was certain that they were about to enter another major storm system visible at every corner, perhaps the worst system they had encountered thus far. They assessed their options and saw no other choice but to stay on course and manage as best they could. Luck had served them well enough thus far, they thought, they secured everything down and water-sealed the spots that had previously opened and leaked. They ate a fastidious dinner of leftovers and prepared for the worst as the next substantial rain began to fall. Most of the crew were below deck, warm and dry. Ott was at the helm, braving the elements, and Commander Binder was at his side, surveying the frightening skies ahead through scans. A twister dove from the spinning clouds like a jabbing finger. A few miles to the west, cut into the earth, then dissipated back into nothingness within a matter of seconds. This looks bad, the Thordian said, holding white knuckle to the guide bar. Despite his steady steer, the ship was being heaved as much sideways in the relentless wind as it was moving forward. Very bad. Curse this flat land. Binder didn't disagree. I've never seen so much rain, he replied. This country soaks it up like a sponge. By my estimates, Tuss would be ten feet underwater by now. Pythagoras nodded. I suspect vast underground caverns and rivers that wash the rainwater away off to the sea. Perhaps a great subterranean ocean lies beneath this land? The heavy skies open up on top of them, and they pass through another leaden curtain of water that blew in nearly horizontal from their port side. Despite the sound of the rain pounding on their ship and the raging wind in their ears, the two of them could partially hear a song starting below. Dreher had pulled out his mandolin once again and had begun to entertain the rest of the crew. It had a miraculous effect on weary hearts and minds whenever he did that. It even made the two of them smile as drenched and as cold as they were. Pythagoras, I'm not much for apologies, but I'll admit that I was wrong about you, Commander Binder said in a rare moment of sincerity and openness. I'm sorry for the way I treated you before. I looked at the man sidelong. Eh, that's not necessary, Commander. We're professional soldiers. Binder shrugged. I didn't behave professionally. I let a personal bias cloud me, a long-time prejudice, and it was wrong of me. Ott nodded gratefully. Apology accepted, my friend. 
I was taken prisoner as a child, Binder reluctantly explained, forced to work with the in the algae stone mines for several years, he explained. Ott stared out the front window. It was nearly impossible to see anything at all. A strong gust of wind pushed the ship sideways with a bump, then let it go. Your captors were Thordians. <clears throat> we lived in a small, rustic coastal town a hundred miles south of Poed, near an inlet of beautiful little lagoon in Gorn, my family and me. A wayside for pirates and travelers selling their wares to the north and south of us. We had an inn there and a livery stable run by my parents and my uncle. Thordians and humans did not get along in those parts. They hadn't for decades. Skirmishes were common, as was kidnapping and slavery on both sides. Thordian mercenaries killed my parents one winter night and took me into the caves in the uh, southern swamps. I was but 12 years old. My village was burned to the ground, and I was enslaved. I survived there for nearly two years before a truce was negotiated, and they finally released me. Dedlin and Jerry have told me of your past. I am sorry. I have found out there are good and bad in every race, mine included. No one can be held accountable for the actions of a few others who tarnish their own reputations. Otherwise, we would all be held in contempt. I do not condone, nor am I responsible for the actions of any other living creature, Thordian or otherwise. Only for myself, Commander, as are you. Yes, I understand that, he said, but sometimes it's a matter of the fears in your heart suppressing that rationale in your mind. When your nightmares are filled with images burned deep from events of your childhood, it's hard to let go of the hate and mistrust that they created subconsciously. This may be no excuse, he replied, scouting above the wail of the weather, but it is the truth. However, what I mean to say is I will try. A battering ram of wind littered the port side hull of the ship with a barrage of uprooted reeds and grasses and several prolonged pounding blasts, some bursting through the tarp like shrapnel. They stung the skin like pins and needles. <clears throat> the star deer tipped far up onto its side with a metallic groan, caught atop a wave of gale force wind, sliding and spinning counterclockwise until Aunt could finally ride it again and regain control. The ship was being pressed hard to the west. Ott grabbed the guide stick and accelerator bar with steel fists, gritting his teeth. Perhaps our new friendship will go a long way towards the therapy where you require, he said, clearly straining. The wind increased even more. The ship shook and rattled. And I am not uh, trying to be rude, but I'm sorry I'm unable to give you the individual attention you deserve right now. I may be losing control here. I think I'm losing the ship. Uh, what is it? What is wrong? Can, can I relieve you? Binder asked. Part of the roof above the helmsman chair ripped off, twisting the flimsy attachment pin in the frame like a battered flag. I tried to seize it, but it tore off and was instantly gone, spinning off into the misty deluge. Damn, he cried. Hold on. Three times the battering ram turned to punch and pummel the skycraft. Star Deer was knocked sidewise by terrible bursts of wind, spinning like a flicked coin on a table. Ott's footing slipped, and he released his grip. The wind caught the ship, pulling it up into the sky, and then released it. It rolled completely up and over, nearly onto its back. The ship's plasteel frame groaned under the pressure. Binder tumbled, sliding across the deck. Ott nearly fell from the ship and out the side door. Whatever was not strapped down on deck was now lost. Damnation! Binder cried, rolling onto his head. Ott, grab the guide stick before we flip over. <coughs> A wide, hot bolt of lightning pierced the sky and buried itself into the earth less than 20 yards from the ship, and thunder pounded down above them like a massive drum. There was an instant smell of char and the taste of copper on their tongues. Static electricity wreaked havoc on both the crew and the instruments of the star deer. Then for a moment, the wind gently released the ship, sprawled across the roof of the helmsman cabin. Ott leaned in and twisted the bent guide stick over, and star deer leveled off with a sad, beaten hiss. 
The ship bounced and bobbed as though on a spring, slowly spinning as the wind pushed it along to the northeast, like a paper boat loose in a rushing stream, up and then down and then over a wide hill. Dedlin's fuzzy head popped up from below. Take her down, he said. Anchor my ship. This is ridiculous. This is ludicrous. We'll sit it out for a while. This storm will kill us all. Everything is topsy-turvy down here. We're rolling around like balls in a box. Down, down. I broke another string, <clears throat> Dreher cried from below. They eased slowly into a pinch in a shallow hollow where they hoped the majority of the wind might pass them by overhead and secure the four corner anchors as best they could into the soggy earth. As Ott began shutting down the controls of the ship, ironically, the storm seemed to slacken and then even pause altogether. Just the thrum of a constant falling vertical rain and distant thunder rolling around the hills in all directions, out beyond any hope of visibility. As Ott looked up and around, the skies turned a pale shade of green. The guide stick and accelerator bar went completely limp in his grasp. It's green, he said. Well, that's weird, Binder said. Down below, everything was in disarray. Let's take out the stock of our supplies and get this mess cleaned up. My poor ship. She held together, but I'll wager she needs some tending to check for any uh, significant damage, the wizard instructed the crew. Outside the ship, the sound of the roaring wind had swirled off and died away, barely more than a vacant carnival whistle one extreme to the other in this forsaken land. I don't like it, Gabriel said. It's too quiet out there, like a tiger eyeing us from the bushes. The rain and wind then stopped completely. There was an eerie dead silence all around them. It was so quiet that they could hear solitary drops of water plopping from the cracks in the ceiling into puddles all around them. The air pressure around them then changed too. It was as if they were now sitting in some type of great vacuum that made it difficult for them to breathe. Day peered out the window. Look, he said, the skies are as green as clover. Not only that, but what kind of sorcery is this, Gabriel said as he joined Day by the window, his voice barely above a whisper, as though he was seeing something that he just couldn't believe. He rubbed the condensation from the porthole with his sleeve. Look outside, Dedlin. The rain is falling upward. Dedlin looked out one window, then quickly out another on the other side. His eyes confirmed Gabriel's observation. Droplets of water were riding up the stems of reeds and grasses, and they were falling upward into the sky. Oh no, it's, it's coming, he whispered. From somewhere miles above them, a distant noise was fast approaching, like the amplified roar of a mighty thunderous engine. As it fell down from the heavens toward them, it got exponentially louder and louder. The air pressure squeezed in their ears, and Star Deer began rattling uncontrollably. Grab onto something, Dedlin cried, diving for an affixed table leg. It's a twister! We'll stop right there. We'll do part two. The next time around, I'm starting to get a sore throat. <laughs> I need a break.